Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week I'm going to be reviewing Twilight Struggle Red Sea Conflict in the Horn of Africa. And this is a Twilight Struggle mini uh, edition designed by Jason Matthews, with a solo by Jason Carr. Alright, so here is Twilight Struggle Red Sea all set up. And as you can see, if you've played Twilight Struggle before, it really does look like a mini Twilight Struggle. And it in fact plays like a mini Twilight Struggle. Uh, there are only two turns and you are fighting with your opponent over a much smaller area of, of the world. So Twilight Struggle Full Size is a Cold War game. It's about the United States and the USSR uh, having conflict in various parts of the world, trying to spread their influence everywhere and you know become the most dominant global power. So in Red Sea, all of it is condensed down into just Africa and the Middle East. So the game essentially plays like full size Twilight Struggle, but a shorter because it's fun size Twilight Struggle. So if you never played the game before, I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of what happens in it. And then we can talk about the solo bots, which are pretty cool. So uh, in this game, you are either the United States or the USSR, and you are fighting for influence in Africa and the Middle East. And that's represented by these countries. In each of these countries, you're going to be trying to place influence and you're ultimately going to be trying to gain control over these different areas. The ultimate result of all that control is hopefully that you'll have the most victory points. And one thing that's kind of interesting about this game is that the victory point track goes up to 10, but it's kind of a tug of war. So only one person ever has positive victory points at a time. And uh, the victory point token will flip back and forth as the United States and the USSR pull each other back and forth. But basically the way this game works is that on your turn, you're gonna have a hand of cards. And you are going to, at the beginning of the turn, choose one that you're going to play as the headline for this turn. So you're going to choose one of your cards to play for an event. You're going to do the event, and then your opponent's also going to do that. After that, you're going to play your cards back and forth, one at a time, and you have choices for how you play them. So you can either play them for their event on the card, or you can play them for their ops value. And ops are going to allow you to do things like place influence in countries, roll to do what's called realignment where you're rolling against the other player and if you get a higher roll with modifiers you remove some of their influence so it makes it easier for you to gain control of the country and then there's also the option to try to stage a coup which is a way to kind of force your way in uh to the government of one of these countries. And of course, sometimes your capabilities are limited because while you're doing this, the threat of nuclear war is very much alive. So your DEF CON status is going to degrade until if you are foolish enough to let it get that bad, you could end up with a nuclear war. And whichever player triggers that automatically loses the game. So you can have uh, nuclear war globally and still win if the other player is the one who did it. So <laughs> be aware. You can also win immediately um, depending on scoring cards. So there's an auto victory um, if you can score Africa and you control Ethiopia and Somalia and you control more African countries than the other player. So that's what these cards are for. The other thing that's very interesting is that each of these events, some of them benefit the United States, some of them benefit the USSR, and then other ones are kind of for both. So whenever you play a card, if you play it for the event, then you do the event for yourself, but you don't get any of the ops points. If you play it for the ops points, but the event is associated with the other player, the event does trigger and they do get to do it. So let's say that I played this card as the United States, I would get three ops points, but also the USSR would get to do the event on the card. And there's nothing I can do about that except decide whether they do the event first or I do my ops stuff first. So this is a game that's kind of an elegant tug of war between players because you're going to get things in your hand that benefit you and you're trying to deploy them to their best effect. You're also going to get things that can unintentionally benefit your opponent and you're trying to find like the best ways to dump those cards so that your opponent gets the worst possible benefit from the events or maybe the event doesn't even trigger at all. Um, but you also want to push them so that they play things that benefit you. And so one of the really magical things about this game is that you're accidentally helping your opponent all the time. They're accidentally helping you. Sometimes you get a good break and there's just a lot of stress involved with that. I think that it's one of the things that makes Twilight Struggle such an interesting and special experience to play.
So in addition to all of the realignments and the coups and all of that, uh, there's also a space race track and you can essentially spend ops points to roll and try to advance up this track and get benefits um, that will accrue to you while you're ahead if you're the first person there. So you also do want to, in fact, race in space uh, because there are some serious benefits to doing so. So that's basically Twilight Struggle. You are in a tug of war over Africa and the Middle East, and you are trying to get the most victory points, and you are doing your very best to assert your dominance against your opponent here. One thing that's also very special about this particular version of Twilight Struggle is not just that it's short and it's easy to set up, all that stuff, but uh, part of the magic is also that there is at last a Twilight Struggle solo. So there was not a solo mode for full-size Twilight Struggle, and I can see why. So this game has maybe like 50 cards, and full-size Twilight Struggle has at least double that. I'm not sure how many cards are in it, but it's a lot. And so it was harder to build a solo bot for that because you want to build something that's responsive, and you know you end up in trouble if you are you know trying to have too many contingencies for too many cards. So the original Twilight Struggle never had this. However, now in the modern era with little short fun size Twilight Struggle, uh, we do in fact get a solo mode. It's designed by Jason Carr and it's quite good. So you will have a solo bot who doesn't have a hand of cards, but who does draw cards from the deck. And there is a flow chart as usual to help you decide what to do. So during the headline phase, uh, you can see what playable events are available to the United States or to the USSR. And there are just little criteria that you can see if a card meets in order to know if you want to play it. And then we also have this bad boy here that's going to help us play each side. So when you are doing solo, uh, you essentially go along these columns to figure out what the priority for the bot is. And then you go down and check the different conditions in these boxes to figure out if you want to play an event card, if you want to coup, or if you want to realign, or if you want to place influence. So this is basically going to help you make those decisions by just doing things in a checklist form. And then of course, here's the back, which is for the Soviets playing as the bot. So again, you're going to have, this is where we start. Here are some different priorities. Check, 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 check. And then what do we do? So as a solo bot, this is actually not too bad. This is a less onerous flow chart based on ones that I've seen in the past. And it does actually operate fairly quickly, which we are about to discuss. So now that you have a sense of how things work, um, we are gonna go ahead and advance to the final thoughts. All right, so now for some final thoughts. Uh, did I like Twilight Struggle Red Sea? Absolutely I did. And I, um, I was really excited just to get a version of Twilight Struggle that was quick to play. Um, Twilight Struggle is a game that I really enjoy, but I never get to play enough because it's just long. It's a huge commitment. I have to find another person and, you know, I roll solo most of the time. So it can be really hard to get a game like that to table. Whereas Twilight Struggle Red Sea really feels like Twilight Struggle, but very, very, very short. So I was actually really impressed by how much Red Sea felt like the parent game of Twilight Struggle. Uh, I was not sure what to expect, but uh, actually I knew exactly what to expect because it was so much like Twilight Struggle. Um, that two turn structure was pretty interesting to see. Um, the addition of flashpoint countries, I think added a little bit of extra drama to that two turn structure. And I also actually liked the strategic sea lanes because it gave me something new to look at and compete for. Um, that wasn't a country, but was something like a little bit different. So the game is basically like Twilight Struggle. There are a couple of little things in it that are new that work nicely in that little two player setup. But truly this game has the exact same tug of war, push and pull, um, you know, what is this person gonna do? How do I play these events in the most irritating order for my opponent possible? You know, all those thoughts go into playing Red Sea just like they do into the parent game. And so it retains a lot of its um, elders greatness. That said, um, sometimes that compressed format can be a little bit frustrating. Um, I know that sometimes like if I don't get good card draws at all, the game's over quickly, so that's really nice. Um, but I sometimes feel like a longer game lets things even out. And so with just that two turn structure, you only get two hands of cards to work with. You really have to milk them and squeeze as much out of them as possible. And they really just may not go your way. 
And so if that's something that frustrates you, um, then I think that, that problem is maybe exacerbated a little bit in this shorter version of the game uh, compared with the longer one. But I personally didn't mind because it's truly a lunchtime game. It's so short and there's so much thinking and, and planning and trying that goes into it that you're going to get a satisfying gameplay experience um, no matter what. And, you know, sometimes the cards don't go your way. Sometimes the dice don't go your way on your, you know, um, your rolls when you're trying to realign or do a coup. But it's really the strategy of choosing a place, trying to get as much influence as possible to modify your roles, trying to play your cards in the best possible way that makes the game satisfying. And while there's randomness in it, I would not say that the randomness is a problem because first of all, you know, when you're having a global conflict, I don't think you actually have very many foregone conclusions, um, but also, you know, there's enough of me feeling like I had control over what happened in the game to mitigate the random elements. I also really liked that this focused on a different part of the world. Um, it felt really different from a bigger Twilight Struggle and it focused on events that I actually didn't know a lot about. And so I really found myself learning a lot by reading the flavor text on the cards. So I didn't know that much about, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union's intervention in Africa and the Middle East during the Cold War until I really started getting into this game. And now I kind of want to know more about it because it is, just incredible how far reaching the Cold War was and how global the conflict really was. And also like connections between the countries in the game are really interesting. So the uh, Romanian autonomy card that you pass back and forth, like the United States player starts with it, whoever has it at the end gets a victory point. I did not realize that Romania had a relationship with Somalia that can be brought into the game in this way. And so I really found the game educational uh, as well as tense and interesting because it was about stuff that I really didn't know about in a region of the world I think is underappreciated, especially in the United States. And, uh, you know, I really thought the game did a lot in that. So it brings that Twilight Struggle flavor to a new conflict with new events that can be played in a larger game, although I haven't tried it. So basically, this is a game that's doing everything right. Uh, that said, how is the solo game? Well, uh, it's good. The bots, you know, if you don't like to deal with flowcharts at all, this game is not going to fix that problem for you. If you're already open to flowcharts in your solo games, then I actually think that these flowcharts are quite good. Um, Jason Carr did a really good job of helping the bot figure out what's important so that as you go through the checklist, it's going to make decisions that are as intelligent as possible at every turn, even though it's AI. And so, you know, the rule book actually acknowledges that there are points where a bot might not be perfect. So it says, oh, if you think the bot can make a better decision here, go ahead and do it. So the rule book explicitly gives you that freedom. I know maybe some people don't want that. They want the bot to just do what it does. So they don't have to play for another player. And that's also a completely legitimate way to play. But the game does a good job of creating a nasty bot that pushes in the right ways. And it also gives you the leeway to adjust that for yourself if you see you know, a need to do that when you play. But I basically have just been playing things straight up the way the bot would, and it's been going really well. There are a couple of points where I think the bot may be extra annoying, specifically with the headline card. Um, I really hate having to draw a bajillion headline cards until I can find one the bot can play. Um, I would say that was my number one bummer with the bot for this game, um, because it's just like, really, do I have to draw another? Okay, let me check the chart. Like, can I use this one? No. Oh, God. All right, let me draw another. Okay, finally, here's a headline card that I can use. So I would say that that was probably the most frustrating aspect of bot play. But everything else worked pretty well. Um, if you are knowledgeable about the game's rules and you have a good sense of what's going on on the board, which is a lot, it's a lot easier to do in this case because the board is so small, then I actually think the solo bot is pretty good. Would I recommend that everybody go buy this just for solo? Uh, that's a more complicated question. Um, I think if you don't mind flowcharts and you really love Twilight Struggle and you really want to play it, then then it would be worth the purchase. Um, if you're just not sure and you just want to get things to try them solo and you heard this had a solo, I might make sure that I really like that Twilight Struggle feeling enough to go and get the whole game just to play with the bot. So for some people, it's going to be awesome. For others, uh, especially if you're not used to flow charts or you're not sure you like them, um, I would wait or see if I get a hand on a copy first, just to make sure that it's the kind of solo experience that you really enjoy. But I did enjoy this one. Um, it was fast. Once I learned how to use the bot, it went really quickly. And I really appreciated that. I like that you can play as either side so that, you know, you're accommodated whether you want to play as the United States or as the USSR. And 
you know, the bot not having a hand but drawing cards actually works really well the majority of the time. And so it's really fun to see a Twilight Struggle with a working solo mode. Um, that said, I can really understand why the original one didn't. Because, you know, that flowchart took a lot of work just with the limited number of cards in this small, short two-player game. I don't even want to know what it would have been like to try to accommodate that larger deck that's in the full-size game. So it's the size of this version of Twilight Struggle, I think, that enables it to have a solo mode like this. And so, you know, I don't I don't really see the the larger parent version of the game having anything of, of this nature. Um, it's definitely the smallness that makes the flowcharts manageable, that makes it manageable to hunt down a headline card. So that said, um, I really like this game. I think that Jason Matthews did a really, really good job of condensing the original Twilight Struggle into a smaller experience. That compact board is really nice. It's a lot easier to track board state when you are doing the flowchart for solo, which I appreciated. So then, you know, you get a, a, a well done, very manageable solo chart that makes pretty good decisions. So Jason Carr did an amazing job with that. So if you really like Twilight Struggle, you don't mind a little bit of flow charting, I think this is a very fun solo experience that is still going to be pretty short. You're not going to have too much of your time eaten up by the bots once you know how to do it. So kudos to this team for making Twilight Struggle soloable at last. It's something that I've longed for for a long time, and I feel like this is a very reasonable option for those of you who want to play Twilight Struggle by yourself. I will say it's probably still better with two people because being able to look somebody else in the eye and like wonder how's this person going to actively screw me over? Is this person going to play my event at a time that is going to just frustrate me even more? Like the, you don't play your events off of the bot. It doesn't trigger them for you because it's a bot. So um, it has some special advantages over you. So there are parts of that two player game that aren't there. But overall, it replicates the experience really well. And that's impressive for Solo. Um, that said, I really do want a second person to play this with because I think it would be even more delicious at two. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment, and most of all, happy gaming.